If it gets out of hand, we turn it over to a supervisor. So we've kind of gotten rid of those, those issues. So we have to work from the ground up, not from the top down. Supervisors, they're not bosses, they're mentors with the operators. So we've broken that back. That's the way you change the morale. And by doing that, it helps the operator feel more comfortable. So he doesn't go out the door headed towards the bus with an attitude. So maybe that's the way you have to work on changing the culture. Everybody over the years, in my years in this industry, has always talked about, we have to change the culture. Stop talking, do it. Maybe that might help in the beginning of maybe minimizing or mitigating some of the issues that are being caused in what we have today. Okay, and I have a question. <laughs> My name is Dwayne Russell, Jacksonville, Local 1197. Uh, I just want to say to the gentleman right there, you stole a little of my thunder. Uh, pretty much, uh, <laughs> what I haven't heard uh, spoke on today is some of the, the pressure that's put on bus operators and which causes incidents out here. Uh, operators are under pressure to, to be on time, on time performance, uh, trying to stay safe at the same time. Uh, you know, we're dealing with personal issues also in our own personal lives. But, you know, we have people that, that's making decisions and discipline operators who's never driven a bus and don't understand our lifestyle because they, they don't know what it is to sit behind that, that steering wheel and drive a, a state bus. Uh, we speak of you know, the pressure. It's tough out here. And I speak, I, I still drive the bus myself. Even though I'm a local president, I still drive the bus myself. And it's tough out there. And we speak of safety meetings. We stagger, we try to stagger, you know, I know my management, they stagger the times. But when the operator can't show up because they're constantly working, trying to make money to feed their family, then you, you suspend them. You put them in the street. You know, and I think that's that's not fair. You know, I think at some point, if you're really concerned about that operator getting to a safety meeting, then you need to pull the operator off the bus and make them attend, he or she attend that, that meeting instead of putting them in the street and causing them to lose money where they can't feed their family. So that's, that's what I want to say. There's a lot more I want to say, but I'll I say that for later. But I appreciate you. And we'll have time again to do this this afternoon. Just want you to know. But we have time for two more questions, I think. Yes, sir. David Rodriguez, Community Transit in Lakeland. I'm sorry. Port St. Lucie. Um, one thing that we, I would like to bring out to attention is usually uh, it takes two to tango. And uh, it sounds to me that we are concentrated on the side of the equation that we can all control. We have cameras, we have audio, we have training, we have barriers. Uh, I would like to know if there is any data out there as to what the impact of a public outreach campaign towards showing the riders that our drivers are people. And if that uh, has any impact on the number of uh, accidents that we see related to assaults. And I do want to say from the app that I believe that we suggest that as a best practice, like the video that we saw with the lovely operator here, is uh, demonstrating to the public that um, operators are really important people, um, that they're your neighbors, they're your aunt, they're your um, you know, Girl Scout leader, and that they're your church pastor. So, um, Lisa, do you want to answer first? Yeah, I do think that um, the data is important, and I know our safety department tracks um, all of our incidents on board the bus. Um, they are trending down, whether we can attribute it exactly to um, any particular programs, but I think it's more about um, total involvement. I mean, it does start with, um, 
um, the customer code of conduct. Uh, unfortunately, um, you might hear later this afternoon, you know, we are trespassing people from our system every single week. Um, and while you know that, you know, it's probably the lifeline for most of these folks, we also don't want them to do things that are gonna be disruptive, not only to our bus operator tour, but to our customers. But I think it's really a combination of, of, of everything in terms of how you involve the public in what the expectation is uh, to, ride, to ride the bus. Because it's just as important for us to provide that lifeline and that customer service to our customers, but they have some obligation as well. You have both pro, uh, programs, the one highlighting the operator and then the one about respecting your, your ride. Yeah, and thank that's a good point. Um, we've, we've been doing that too, and part of it was when Polly came over from APTA, it was a best practice, and we've done a, a pretty big campaign with humanizing the bus operator to the public, showing what, you know, like you said, there's someone's mom, there's someone's sister, you know, trying to get that out, because something has happened past couple of years where you know you got this person in a uniform a professional driving a bus and the lack of respect has really gone down to them so we're trying to bring that back up with some public awareness and we do have something where we go to different schools actually in the dc area there's like 120 charter schools and about that many dc public schools and there's no school bus for them they ride the metro and about 30,000 of them ride our metro buses. So that's a picture of a bus operator driving a bus full of kids that just got out of school. And we're trying to, we go to the different schools and try to talk to them and educate them on how to respect your ride, whether it's on the rail or on the bus. So your point's well taken. And I know that a lot of transit properties have gone to the respect your ride videos that they play on buses and rail, telling the customer what their responsibility is to follow the rules as well. Um, Jim, um, Ed, Jean-Claude, anybody want to talk about? I can just say, aside from a lot, also in Charlotte, they have a riders wrote a riders code of conduct, and if riders do not what is perceived certainly as behave, then they can actually be barred from riding public transit. So that's one of the things. And their picture's posted, so the operators know who they are, and they are charged with trespassing. So that's one of the things that Charlotte's done for, a, for quite a while, and I think other agencies are uh, looking at that where someone is no longer riding to ride on a system for a given period of time. The court's actually ruled you can't ban them for life, so, uh, but there was things that someone can be banned from riding transit for up to five years. So that's uh, pretty extensive, and if they do, then they're arrested for criminal trespass. Yeah, so. so um, the transit authority that I've worked for, Houston, Denver, Chicago, they all have um, a public awareness campaign. I know for a fact that Denver and Houston their bus operator software trending down. Chicago, it was trending down for a minute and then it went up again. So I can't uh, attribute um, the downward trend or the high, higher trend to the transit campaign. I do know that um, not only <laughs> do they have a campaign about a bus operator and about the employee. They also have the see it, say it, um, and those things as well. I'll be right there. Are they referred to EAP? 
what is the prevention problem? Because we have all these problems if they don't, you know, do their job. But what is really happening to the operators if they are assaulted on the job? Do they have so many days to report back to work? What is, you know, are they forced to use their time? This really should be working. But I want to know what is what is done about that. Okay. Well, once again, we're going to start with please. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's hard to say that there is a, a written policy that spells out exactly um, what happens, but if an operator calls in and has been assaulted, I mean, the first thing that the dispatcher does is ask them if they're, if they're okay. Um, do they need to be relieved? If it is an actual assault, you know, say that someone's been hit or something, um, then that operator is immediately removed from the box. They are given the time they need. They are referred to EAP um, because I do think all of those things are, are important if, if an incident happens. It's very hard to say, you know, that for everyone is exactly the same. Um, we've had situations where customers would yell at an operator, which can be a form of assault. You know, that operator may or may not want to be relieved from the box. The, the, Customer may be removed and the operator's fine to go on. Other cases where operators have been spit on. I mean, they're actually relieved from the bus, they're sent home, um, you know, and, and some operators have been out one day, two days, it really just depends on the situation. But I think what we've, um, what we've made sure of is that our dispatcher, that's the first thing they ask. Are they okay? Do they need to be relieved? Do they need to be at the continuing service? So it is important to make sure you understand because not every operator handles an assault the same way. Thank you, Lisa. I don't really have much to add to that. It's pretty much the same thing. Some bus operators go out for a lot longer time. Um, and a so longer stomp, though? That was kind of the question. Is they, are they required to go through on the leave or are they going out and work for comp? Yeah. Employees workers comp, but I'm not 100% sure. But some come, some, you know, just don't even need any time off, but we do refer all of them to EAP, so. All I can speak is my tenure when I was there. Actually, depending on the exposure, for example, if someone, whether it's a bloodborne pathogen exposure, then that definitely is a worker's comp because you want to also know what the level is of that exposure. When I was actually in New York City a couple of weeks, well, a couple of months ago, and actually there was an operator that someone, we, we talked about the shield on this side, but somebody from the outside window threw urine on the operator. In fact, there were two cases in that same week, same person, they believe, the same perpetrator. However, then those folks need to actually go through the screening for bloodborne pathogens that should fall under workers' compensation because it is a potential injury that occurred while performing the functions of those duties. So then it would be workers' comp, and then if they have uh, EAP is typically always available, but unless the agency, depending on what the specific rule or policy, that for that kind of exposure would be under a worker's compensation. And then one other thing I wanted to add is that uh, some, agencies, some agencies do send people from the authority with the bus operator if it ever gets to court, so that the bus operator is not alone in the court environment and that the perpetrator hasn't brought their posse and that the bus operator is there by uh, him or herself. So that's another best practice is to make sure if it ever gets there uh, that, you know, and, and of course that's a wonderful thing for both union and management uh, to do together. And I'll get you uh, uh, here and then I think we're gonna uh, wrap it up because um, we have to have Eric tell us everything we just talked about again as he's our lunchtime speaker. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Mike Lowry. I'm the uh, president and business agent of ATU Local 1395 out of Pensacola and the chairman of our legislative conference. But I've been a bus operator approaching 25 years. In my third year, I was just doing my job. And I will tell you, I've never had a customer complaint, never ever been, you know, had a conflict, never had an accident. And Yes, I'm the president of the union. I don't drive the bus the last few years anymore. But my third year, I had a passenger stick directly in my face, into my mouth. And 
what kind of, the point that I want to make to you, and I was leaning towards Dean Claude because it's just something you said earlier, is that we're looked at as authority on the bus. And uh, in this moment, it was a conflict between two passengers. So the entire bus turned to me because there's no one there of authority outside of the bus to show up. They look at me, I'm in the uniform. And when I approach the situation and try to resolve the situation, I receive the backlash. So I guess where I'm looking at is, uh, Jean Claude, you said, and it caught my attention, three E's, engineering, education, and enforcement. The engineering, I agree with everything. I think where the problem is, is that education and enforcement tends to slap off as time goes on. And I hope that today, that's the discussion between everybody here, is that those, I thought the three E's caught my attention, and I appreciate what you said. And I was curious, why do you think the education and enforcement slaps, tends to fall off the spectrum versus the, the uh, engineering? Okay. Don't look. So, in my experience, the education and enforcement tends to slack off because it's not something that is permanent, right? It's something that changes as time goes on. Uh, we state that uh, in doing hazard resolution that a, a training program must happen, right? A lot of times in my last 10 to 15 years, we state how frequently that training must happen. Sometimes people just state it as a one-off, right? But it shouldn't be. It should be something that continues on and on and on and on and on. The, the issue is, is that there are so many levels of complexity and so many levels of issues that come up daily that sometimes that training that you spec'd out to happen five years ago on a continual basis isn't kept in the forefront. Now it's something else. Now it's something new. So now let's switch the resources from this training to this training, when in fact all of the training is needed. And then uh, is when you're talking about bus operators or rail operators, it's difficult to pull somebody off of their shift to do training, because we don't have reserves, right? There is not 15 to 20 bus operators or rail operators that just sitting by waiting, right? So it's up to management to <laughs> devise a strategy to keep the people that aren't working trained but paid because you can't have people come in for training on their days off if they're not getting paid, right? And you also have to ensure that everybody is trained. Um, the education and enforcement part, I've been speaking to CEOs around the country about this, and I think with the new uh, uh, safety management system and the new ability that they have to redirect funds from a capital investment to a training investment or something of that nature, I think things are going to get so it all goes back to SMS, and Jim, uh, you brought that up, and I've had, uh, talked about it as well. Um, this, you know, there's huge opportunities here with SMS to um, take advantage of that to uh, do training and promotion. Uh, with that, I want to um, applaud the panel, and more importantly, applaud you for your participation. is that the uh, folks with the barriers are also here. It's a room kind of across the hall, uh, and down the hallway, and you're encouraged to go through there and see that as well uh, during the lunch period. And we're to, uh, what are we doing for lunch now, Colin? Uh, uh, they're uh, box lunches, so I believe they're gonna be out in the foyer here. Okay, and then you bring them back in yeah. here and yeah. eat, and then we're, um, should be in our seats at what time? Uh, 12.30. 
12 30 everybody apparently we, oh the lunches are in the back so go to the back change of plane go to the back get your lunch um go see the uh, barriers and come back at what time folks come back at 12 30 right
We do have one of the United States premier uh, bus rapid transit systems. It goes from our Dayton and South Metro rail stations all the way down to Southwest 334. <coughs> and that will be turning into the Busway Express rapid transit now that our SMART plan has been approved. So on the rail side of the house, I know we're here for bus, but I just want to tout everything that we do because we are multimodal. Um, we have 25 miles of, of uh, mainline dual track, 750 volts DC. Uh, the highest elevation we have is 70 feet over the Miami River. We have 23 passenger sta station, 136 rail cars, of which we're very proud that we are getting new cars, cars from Hitachi Rail. Uh, right now we have 80 on property with another uh, some to be delivered. Not all of them are in service. They're all undergoing safety certification. Some are out of service due to EMs and safety certification process. Um, we have intermodal stations at Virgin Trains, which uh, was Brightline. It's now been renamed Virgin. Virgin Trains, Tri-Rail, Metro Mover, South Bay, Transitway, and Miami International Airport. We have 19.1 million passenger trips per year, and we operate 19 hours per day. We also opened the Orange Line, which is the MIC, the Miami Intermodal Center, uh, in July of 2012. On the Metro Mover side of the house, it's a fully automated 4.4 mile people mover system. It operates on 13.2 kV, stepped down to 600 volts AC. Just to go through, if you can see, we have the financial district, also the downtown business loop, and the Omni district, or the Omni loop, which is over by uh, uh, what is the Hilton and the Omni Center. So it has 21 stations, and we carried 8.8 .8 million people last year. And that's also in service 19 hours per day. Now, we'd like to showcase what we're getting from New Flyer, Oh, I'm sorry, SDS, I missed that slide again. Um, so SDS, we have 1.7 million boardings per year, mandated by the ADA. Right now we have 30,950 eligible clients enrolled, that's in July 2019, and that operates 24 hours per day. So that's our new, that's part of our new CNC safeguard, our fleet, the people, our first feed and back. So that video feed will never be lost. So right now we have eight. So what do we have on our buses right now? We have Mobile View 7000. A lot of people have Mobile View. I'm not going to be touting Mobile View. Or we, we run Mobile View 7000. We have, uh, um, we have between 10 and 14 different camera angles on the buses. Uh, we have the top right. The second one in is a 4K camera, which is forward facing, and all the other angles are 1080p. So that has a 30 day overwrite also, and that has uh, automatic download when you come into the Revenue Island. It's equipped with uh, internet connection that automatically downloads the whole entire hard drive. So that's what we have right now. This is just the setup of camera angles that we have. We'd like to believe that we don't have any dead areas or we don't have any blind spots. The way that we configured this and the way that we shut down with, with the bus manufacturers, kept them engaged, kept the union engaged, management, our engineering companies, our engineering staff that we have made sure that to the best of our ability, we didn't have any blind spots in the, in the bus. Um, because, you know, Murdoch, something happens and that's the, that's the angle you don't have. Okay. All right, this is what we're all here for, right? So, the bus operator compartment door. Now, how did we get here? How did we actually equip the buses throughout the United States with these bus operator compartment doors? Through a lot of research back in the day when I was asked to do this, one, uh, a, a similar presentation at the APTA bus conference out in Seattle, it was like, it was a, a little history lesson on my part, going through our field engineering people and our bus operations people to get documentation back from this far. So in 1996, uh, with, in conjunction with the TCRP, the, the Transit Cooperative Research Program, 
Miami Day Transit and a bunch of other uh, industry professionals went over to Europe to look at driver security. Now it wasn't just bus. It was bus, rail, and any other types of transportation that was over there. But when they were over there, they saw a design for the bus operator's safety that I would say it doesn't come up automatically. It closed, it had hinges, it was plexiglass, some were metal, some were fully enclosed. Some looked uh, like just the whole area was closed with a steel box. But when they were over there, the assistant director then of bus operations said, you know what, I'm gonna take this back to the United States. He was part of the TCRP research program that went over there. He said, I'm gonna incorporate it into Miami Day Transit. I'm gonna make the assurance and I'm gonna make the effort to put it into all of our buses when I get home. So we struck out on that adventure. And they, we struck out on that to, to look at engineering firms, look at bus operations, look at bus manufacturers that were able to put something together for us. Now, it was us and Muni at the time that were the two agencies that spearheaded this drive in the United States. So in 1997, a year after, the first bus operator, the first bus came to Miami Day Transit with the first bus operator compartment door. As you can well believe, or well assume, nothing happens on the first time that is fantastic, okay? So we thought that we had the, the design correct. We thought that everything is done per the engineering design guidelines and everything, and it was built to manufacturer specs and things like that. However, they found that what we built and what the manufacturer put in and the structural integrity of the bus and the components and the bus operator compartment door, we weren't able to mimic that of those things that we saw in Europe. So over the first series of the, bu of the buses, the bus operator compartment door presented challenges with the list is numerous. These are the top four, the weight, the hinges, the latches, and the securement. It was a heavy piece of equipment the latches failed, the securement method and the engineering of the securement lock failed. Um, could it be from the manufacturer or the vendor or the engineering behind it? They, it was a work in progress. So over the years, they looked at what failed. It was building a better mousetrap. So during all of these iterations of the design, and all the iterations of the manufacturer sending the bus operator compartment door, we finally thought that we got it right. Okay, so in 2003, Miami Day Transit finalized what we thought was the best design and the best compartment door, and we put it into our technical specifications that we would put out for all the procurement of future buses. So as of this date, the 800, we're retiring buses, so that 800 is a little less. But as of this date, all of our buses at Miami Day Transit are equipped with bus operator compartment doors. So this hasn't just happened overnight. We are, I would say, the, the leader in the United States when it came to this because everybody in the United States was pushing to get this out after recent tragic events, not only here, but other properties. People were asking after the Apple bus conference about our technical spec. So trust me when I tell you, Ed Watt, you're correct, copying and steal everything, okay? So this technical spec was shopped out to every transit agency that asked me for it. So at this time, how do we feel about our bus operator compartment door. Now, I can tell you that the bus operator compartment door has two recent iterations, the one that we just talked about and the one that you see here, which is what we have in place on, legacy, on the legacy fleet. But I'm fortunate enough to chair our union management safety committee. Now, I can, I can, I'm honored to have Vice President Joe D'Elia 
And also Kevin Craig and Brian Gunn in the back, if you guys can raise your hand. These guys are in our union management safety committee on a regular basis. We do have a tremendous partnership with them on this specific matter because we understand what it takes to keep the bus operators safe. And listen, our job is to make sure that you come to work and you go home from work. That is our goal. You make it home safely. So when we queried the Union Management Safety Committee, we said, you know what? I need a brief statement from you guys about the bus operator compartment door. We've had a lot of feedback. We've had some people, hey, it's too confining. I can't talk to Mrs. Jones that comes in every day. I want to have some interactivity, things like that. But resounding, resounding. This is the feedback that we got from the TWU. I didn't, I didn't take it and edit it and you know take out all the bad stuff. It was just one of those things. These operators really have a sense of security when they get in there with the bus operator compartment door. Now, when we go on to the new iteration of the compartment door, the gentleman in the back, along with all their companies, sat at the table to tell us what they wanted and tell us what they needed and tell us how to build the next iteration of the better mousetrap, okay? Also in attendance is our Deputy Director of Operations, Mr. Steve Vile, who comes to us from WMATA and New York City Transit. He was the Senior Vice President of Rail up at New York City Transit and the COO of WMATA. So in the partnership with the union, he commissioned a bus operator safety task force, which the gentleman in the back and Mr. Fahl have spearheaded to make sure that the bus operators and the union officials and the union representatives come to us with safety concerns, come to us with concerns like this bus operator department door. Hey, I've got a problem on this route. Hey, I've got a problem on that route. It's not just the bus operator department door. We realize that keeping the bus operator safe is an everyday situation. We understand that. We also want to bring to the table any concerns that they have and vet them through this task force. So it's a partnership that keeps growing. And once we get to some of the statistics and things like that, we are running a safer operation for the bus operators and for the patrons. So, there was an issue early on <clears throat> where there was, there was a, a feeling of confinement, things of that nature, and some of the bus operators not always open the door or, or close the door when they're in the operation. It is a rule, it is a procedure. The, the drawback that we have with this design is, yes, you can tie it open. And that's not what we want. So after we looked at all of the engineering, all the designs, everything like that, and I'll show you in a minute, we came up with a, a better mousetrap. Okay. So the fact is that the people that were, were opening it and bungee cording it open were afforded the opportunity because of the engineering. It wasn't because of, um, you know, just by happenstance. Jean-Claude said it the best, you engineer out things or hazards or mitigate, it, mitigate the known hazards to a level, level that is acceptable. It's exactly the principles we live by every single day in our profession. So we took out that variable. You can use a rule to mitigate it. So you made the rule. You have to have the bus operator department door closed when you're in motion. That is to protect the bus operator, okay? And you want to engineer out the door's characteristics to allow that rigging to happen. So you'll see in a couple minutes how we do that. Now, the strap and the attachment that you see, the attachment allowed the bus operator, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the locking device allowed the operator to put the door all the way back and bungee cord it to that stanchion that you see on your right hand side. We've seen that, I'm not gonna say Many, many occasions, but there were occasions when we saw that. Bus operator was re-instructed. Okay, done deal. Proceed on your route. So as we go back to the after conference in the bus up in Seattle, 
This is the technical specifications that were all the rage in our RFP. So these have made it around the United States many, many, many times. But I think one of the key things here is that you're going to see, if you take a look at this and compare it to the one that I'm gonna show you for the new bus operator compartment door, there's a number of specific areas that we, that we targeted that we got union people involved, that we got the union officials involved, that we got our engineer people involved. Because I can tell you that this was the first cut or the second cut at the technical specs for the RFP. There were things that we needed to learn from the bus operators, from the union, from the engineers. So this was, the, this was in the RFP in 2014 when it went out. So you have a let's say a new viewer approved equal. There, there are some things in there that needed to be tightened up and we knew it. But we put, we put the RFP on the street and we got a good bus operator compartment door that fit our needs for that particular, those particular incidents. So now that we've seen the old, now we have the new. So you can see that we're much more specific in this, and based on this activity, this is what this was, like I said, through union management partnership and our own engineers and bus manufacturers out there, we found out, you know, this is doable, we can do it, we can build it. The key here is that the production of this, we have to take a look at the mock-up when it comes to Miami Dade Transit before we approve the bus operator compartment door. There are many iterations that were posed to us. Uh, I think we've got probably one of the best in the United States right now. It looks similar to the one in the vendor's room with different properties, uh, but it does fit what we needed and what we need to safeguard our bus operators. One of the things that I want to let you know, and one of my colleagues, Brian Sherlock, brought to me um, was the glare problem. It's never sunny in Florida. Don't worry about it. There's no glare. <laughs> Don't worry about that. If you're going towards the Atlantic Ocean, it's sunrise, there's no glare whatsoever. Okay? However, Brian sits on the new TCRP panel and TCRP synthesis report that is going to look at bus operator compartment doors and the attributes and the workstation of the bus operators. This is going hopefully to be out in July of 2020 and they will address those kinds of issues hopefully with subject matter experts at a very high level with a lot of confidence in what they're putting in the report to show to the industry, guess what? The bus operator compartment doors, these, these things and other things we believe will help keep your bus operator safe. Not just the physical barrier, but other things that we can put in the bus operator compartment that will make his or her job a lot easier and a lot safer. So that's how it morphed into what we have today in the 2018 RFP for our buses that went out on the street. So what does it look like? It looks a heck of a lot like the one that's over in the other in the other room. Okay? But Unlike the one in the other room, one of the things and the feedback that we got from our, our people in the back from the PWU was, hey, listen, the, the full plexiglass and polycarbon part of it and the glass shield is very confining, okay? So that's one of the things that we, that we wanted the ability for them to adjust. So if you look at it, you see the, the window is adjustable at many different levels and can slide all the way back. It can also slide all the way forward. So you have the ability to adjust the second tier of that bus operator compartment door shield as you feel necessary. Most often, and we recommend that they put it fully closed, closed when they are operating the bus. Now, these, these bus operator shields are approximately $5,000 a piece. But, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that's a very, very small amount of money when it comes to your time off, your you know, on-the-job injuries, things like that. That is a drop in the bucket, okay? So you're losing time, wages, 
days, have to bring people in possibly in overtime, that's a drop in the bucket. So this is what we have on our buses right now. And TCR PG-17 will hopefully shed some light on, on the issues that, that can, can enhance the bus operator's experience as a bus operator. So this is just another look. <clears throat> it looks similar to the, to the ones that you see, or the one that you see in the vendor room. Um, and also the, the second tier of the, of the sliding polycarbonate glass is all the way closed in that one. So the securing device and the, uh, and the latch looks strikingly similar to the one in the other room. And it was engineered actually to coincide with the new installment of the fare box that we have. Now, the bus operator compartment doors out there that were proposed in the industry that I've looked at, you had to completely retrofit the bus and move the fare box and then put it right at the bus operator's knees and things like that. It was very awkward to get into the bus operator compartment. So there was a lot of time, a lot of effort, management, union, partnership. I can't tout that enough standing up here. They told us what they needed. Management, management put on the table what we needed as far as uh, maintaining the fare collection unit, things like that. So we put everything back onto the manufacturer and the vendors to say, hey, listen, this is what we need. This is how we need it configured. Show me how you're going to make it happen. Okay? So in, the, in this, also, there isn't a securement device on the outside or a locking mechanism that would allow a bus operator to hinder the, the closing or the bus operator door to remain closed. Okay, so the next slide is a video. It's pretty self-explanatory. It has no sound, I apologize. Um, it is of a TWU bus operator from Miami Day Transit entering the bus, um, securing himself, closing the door. One person comes in, taps in, everything's fine, and goes back. The other, the other person comes in, taps in, Seems to not have enough fare on his easy car or the fare media. Uh, they get into, it's not a heated argument. They, they have a dispute, but what I want to show you is my guy reaches over, attempts to reach over and, and make contact with the bus operator. And I want you to see the biomechanics regarding the extent of the reach and what the actual bus operator compartment door hinders. Because if you really want to get to our bus operator, you're gonna to have to go well above and beyond, and beyond you know, the normal reach and things like that, with the way this is configured. So I hope it's okay. And like I said, it doesn't have sound. So it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, alleged fare dispute. It's tough to get to the bus operator. Um, and I'll go through some signage with you that we did post on the, uh, on the bus so that the patrons out there know exactly the code rules of conduct, 
the legislation behind touching our bus operators and things of that nature. Okay, so what does this all mean and how do we break it down? Well, the deputy chief, you know, really, really sums it up. It's going to happen. But like Ed said this morning, zero salts should be everybody's goal. And that is zero assaults. We deal with, like I said, if you look at this chart, we deal at 30 million, between 30 million and 35 million uh, passengers or mile, we, miles driven every single year. We carry 19 and a half million people. So, Unfortunately, as the deputy chief said, it is going to happen. It's just we have to strive to get to zero. We put the physical barriers in there. We put the education out there, the engineering, the education enforcement, like Jean-Claude spoke about this morning. So we educate our public through signage. We try our best to engineer out the ability to get to the bus operator. And we'll see enforcement in a couple more slides. But these are hard stats. We look at everything that is reported to us. We have a supervisor's report form that we go by. If something happens out there on, on the 90 plus routes that we run that involves incidents like this, the bus operator, the bus supervisors will write the reports. They give it to us. We deal with the raw data. We crunch it. We come up graphically with how we're doing. So these are actual physical assaults. They actually get touched. Or, as the deputy chief said this morning, that expectorating, expectorating, the spitting, struck with an object or fluid, people get upset, and normally it's when they leave the bus. And then they and then they ditch. These are the actual physical contacts. And then we have the people that come on your bus and just have a bad day and tell you about who you are. <laughs> so you have, we all seen that. So we got the, we got the non-physical incidents, the verbal or the physical threats, the verbal argument or altercation. So those happen, okay? People have bad days. You may engage, do not engage. As a bus operator, do not engage. As the deputy chief said, they get up out of their seat, and engage. One of the limitations of the bus operator compartment door, you really have to want to get up out of your seat to engage. You have to open that door, you gotta physically get out of your seat and go. So these are these are the numbers that we keep. So we keep all of these on a daily basis. So we have the ability to give you guys this information on actually how we're doing. Now, what's the legislation behind this? So in 2012, we had, a champ we had a champion far before that in the Florida legislator le legislation that actually championed raising the penal penalties for assault, battery, ag assault, and uh, for transit bus operators or, tra or transit employees. So as you can see in 78407, to A and B and C, those have been <coughs> upped. So in the case of aggravated assault from a felony of the third degree to a felony of the second, battery, misdemeanor of the first to a felony of the third. So it's these kinds of things that push us, not only on the reporting side of the house, but pursuing them through the state attorney. So this gives us the opportunity to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. And one of the things that we tell the union, listen, if your operators are assaulted, assault, have contact or everything, stop, stand, make the report. We can't move forward unless you have a police report backing this up. <clears throat> so what we need, that reporting side of the house. So the union in the safety management meeting and also in the labor management meeting has made that commitment. 
tell their bus operators how to, what to do after an assault happens. Because it's a lot of times that the bus operators, I feel okay, I'm just gonna proceed. No, you need to make a report and prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. Also, the signage that you saw on our buses isn't new. We sign our buses to make sure that's the part of the John Claude educational part of this part of the part of the mitigating uh, mitigating strategies. You have to educate the people on the bus of what can happen and the consequences surrounding their actions. So, guess what? If you assault our bus operator, five years or five thousand dollars. Five, up to five years, five thousand dollars. So, we do that. The Crime Stoppers, four seven one tips. That is all throughout Miami, and that is a rapid response from our Miami Dade police officers. <clears throat> also, the educational side of the house. We have the signage. If you look at the first bullet on the left, have your Easy Card, Easy Ticket, or Exact Cash ready upon boarding. We all know. On the union side of the house, the operators that are sitting out there, the union people, fair disputes. Okay. On the right side, the first bullet, please don't disrupt, distract, harass, or threaten the bus operator, transit employee, or other passengers. We also use the signs by the bus operator's compartment door about the penalties if you do. Also, one of the features that we've had on buses and on this new, uh, on the new uh, contingent of CNG fleet is what you saw in the, uh, in the video, is the call police. There's three different methods to call bus traffic control. RTT, PRTT, and silent alarm. RTT, request to talk. PRTT, priority request to talk. C, silent alarm, okay? Silent alarm will sim simply put this up on your bus and open the ambient mic on the bus. So that is a, that's a feature that has aided us many times in the past. And if things go very south and sideways, it's an opportunity for Miami-Dade Police Department <clears throat> to get there and even listen in if they're up in our central control facility. So what do we do out of my office on the security side of the house? I have safety and I also have security. So we have security initiatives. We have teamed with Miami-Dade Police Department, who has been an invaluable resource in battling things on the bus, rail, mover, and SDS. So we have been doing, every month, we do ride-alongs where an undercover unit will be inside your bus with a trailing chase car. So if something should happen on that bus, and we target buses based on security incidents that we either get from in-house, the union tells us about a problem route or a problem location, or the Comstat meetings that our security people attend every single month with Miami-Dade Police Department and other jurisdictions that we run through. We have a Comstat meeting the last Thursday of each month with those bodies, and we'll let them know where our problem spots are, and they'll let us know where they believe that they're gonna target next. We also have our transit watch program, which is a 24 hour hotline. That has a hard line ring down into our central control facility. It goes straight to our security desk, which is manned 24 hours a day by our private contract security firm. They can dispatch officers anywhere throughout the county or make a hard line 911 call to Miami Dade Police Department. <clears throat> so we've incorporated the Miami Dade Transit Transit Watch app. This is a subscription service that we have from a company out of California. Denver incorporated this probably five or eight years ago, won Aptus Gold Security Award for it, for great initiatives. But really, what it is, it's an app that lets a person report a security problem anonymously. If you're on the, if you're on the train or on the bus or anything, Hey, yeah, I got this guy in black pants and a white shirt standing right next to me. He's harassing me. Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah. There's very few people that want to engage like that in a closed environment that puts them at risk. So you can anonymously uh, fill all the fields out <clears throat> on the app, and it goes straight down to 
to our top, to our security uh, station two conference desk upstairs at central control. And I have a person that's man at that station 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all they do is converse and monitor with the person on the other end of the transit watch. You can actually have a chat feature <clears throat> where you can chat with my person up at central control, giving them more information. You fill out the field and put everything in. And as our union official advised me in the back, doing sign language and the whole thing, you can also take a picture of the actual perpetrator or suspect, and it'll come through as a GIS or a JPEG or whatever format is compatible. So this isn't new to the industry, everybody. Denver's doing it, Boston did it. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the guys up in Washington. I mean, it's, it's not new. It's just something that, you know what, it's a resource we haven't tapped into fully. But listen, these guys would love to come to you. There's a lot of bells and whistles that you can get put placed into this stuff. And it's a very, very good form of communication from the riding public to our central control facility. Now, what we talked about before and what the, the five people that stole my thunder up here talked about <laughs> was, was training. How do we, what do we do? I mean, we got all this good stuff out there. I can show you stats from whatever, and I can crunch data, and I can show you materials and things like this. But the most important asset that you need out there is a trained bus operator. There's nothing that is a substitute for that. And there is an amazing thing, you know, when, when Leticia said this morning, be nice, I really call, I mean, be nice. You do not want to engage. The chief, deputy chief told you this morning, the problems happen most often when the bus operator gets out of the seat. It's the verbal back and forth that escalates into the bus operator getting out of their seat. That's why in our training program, we stress a lot of things. We stress that quote unquote ancient you know, the verbal judo that everybody's, you know, pouting. But we have to understand who we, who we ride on an everyday basis. Mrs. Jones comes in great one day, and the next day she's not real happy. And you're the first person she's gonna take it out on you because you're the first person she's seen that day. And we believe that I mean a transit, and you should believe as agencies and union uh, officers and affiliates that you're transit agencies armed with all of these tools to put those bus operators out on the street and give them the education and give them the skills that they need to communicate effectively with those people that get on your buses. Not everyone is the same. Not everyone is the same. We can track it back to the morning peak, afternoon peak, and those people that are riding at the late, late hours of the night are completely different than the people that are during the peak that have to get to work, okay? We know that as an agency. We know that as an Office of Safety and Security. We know that as a Deputy Director of RAD. We know that as union officials. We can tell our people, hey listen, not everybody is the same. We all have different pressures. We all have different things that we're thinking about. So try to, try to use a little empathy when you're dealing with everybody. Dealing with difficult passengers. Heat, hear them out, empathize, apologize, and take action. Okay, so I think one of the key points with this and the training package that your people are putting together is know your riders and know that all of them in a split second could change. And be aware of your surroundings. <clears throat> be aware of the patrons that get onto your bus from the time they get onto your bus till the time they get off your bus. Scan your mirrors, scan your rear views, scan your interior rear, the whole thing. Know all the people and their whereabouts on your bus. And I believe that's all I have. So I appreciate everybody's attention. I know it's after lunch. Um, and I know you heard the same thing from five, you know, skilled subject matter experts out there. I mean, I, I deal with all those guys every single day and all the conferences and everything. We both, all of us interact. All the people that are presenting today we all know each other on a, on a personal level and a professional level. 
and we're all just a phone call away. So if you need anything, my number is posted all over the internet and everything like that for Miami Dade Transit. Um, I'd be more than happy to, you know, help you guys out with anything you need. All my, you know, all my colleagues know that I'm, I'm a straight shooter. I'll tell you what you need. I'll give you what you need. Nothing out there, um, except for security sensitive information. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of things in our in our agency, we all do. We're all faced with the same exact struggles every single day. But I'll leave you with this: the union management partnership on this has got to be solid. We have a very strong partnership when it comes to this in Miami Dade Transit. They know that they that we as management feel it on our level, and our deputy director has tasked us, myself, and the union officials to make sure things are brought to the table. I could go off on the SMS speech and you know the non-punitive reporting and everything and, and fill you guys with all of you know 673 and 674. But the fact is that you need that type of partnership to move forward to address the security concerns at your agency. And it has to be open, it has to be frequent, and there can be no, you know, you know, no holes barred, but no punches thrown because we know absolutely that at the end of the day, we need to safeguard our patrons as well as our employees. Any questions? Thank you very much for your now, I think I misspoke because our Vice President Joe Lee is going to ask me a question and I'm not going to know the answer. So go ahead. <laughs> I just want to everybody know that I'm going to be an executive vice president over at City 91. My are Chief Shop Steve Kevin Craig. I'm here at the City Vice President in Lawrence Gun. He's also the chairman of the Safety Division. I do apologize. It's Lawrence, not Brian. We just wanted to reiterate and confirm we have a lot of disagreement when it comes to wages, when it comes to working environments, but as far as safety, when safety is concerned, we have a great partnership. I have to give props to uh, Deputy Director C5. He took the initiative to create a bus operator safety task force. I took the lead on the union side. Yes, I'm also from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you, you know, to the safety and security uh, for helping us. We had issues with bus operators. We had a state representative that we went up to see during the legislative session uh, this year that wanted data on bus operator assaults, whether verbal or physical. And uh, between uh, Deputy Director Five and uh, uh, Eric London, they helped us out a lot getting the data so I could send it up to the state representative, Mr. Senator. So I just wanted to say thank you. Bus traffic control. 
You can have a request a thought, priority request a thought. Now it flashes red and bumps you off the top of the queue in their computer system. Or silent alarm, which it automatically bumps you up and opens your mic. Okay, that's my opinion. Yeah, that, that's exclusive to, I'm not gonna say my day transit, but that's exclusive to our transit agency. It's not, It's. it doesn't filter to, to PD, it's internal to the agency. Okay, thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Any other questions? I know you guys are gonna think about 50 and then call me up tomorrow, so. <laughs> I appreciate your help. I appreciate your attentiveness. If you guys need anything at all, there's my contact information. Feel free to send me any questions you have or offer information because I will copy and steal everything. <laughs> all right. Have a great afternoon.
Now, some of you might remember this meeting because some of you might have been in the audience, and I know there's a few of you that are, but with a resounding answer. In Florida, regarding Florida operations and transit ridership, what do you think they said? No. no. We had information. We had information from our friends from Miami Dade, and we had other bits and pieces that were coming down from the north. But what are we famous for down here in the south? Sun and fun. Sun and fun and everything that's in between. We have a gray area, and that gray area is called time. We get it a bit of a time continuum down here at points, don't we? That's why a lot of people escape gum here, our ridership too. So I wouldn't be the first one to acknowledge, and I'm the first one to usually go into the gray area to say that we haven't experienced the same level of incidents and accidents as, well, certain accidents, as we know that they're definitely the, uh, we're in collisions, but we haven't experienced it at the same level. So when I spoke to the group out west, and they wanted to talk a lot about de-escalation because that was the topic. Their biggest point of concern and question at that time is how do we go home at night? We can talk tangible items all day long. What about the intangibles? What about the ones that are the most difficult to address? What about those when you talk to a nurse who was stuck by a, a needle during routine work inside an emergency room, or a, a police officer or a fireman, what about those folks that go through a similar type of trauma, different type, how are they handled? And why is our trauma handled any different with such care and concern? We need to emulate what we're expecting, which is a very high, high level of concern for our employees. Our employees are our greatest asset, are they not? Yeah. Absolutely. So it shouldn't come in any type of debate on whether we want to or not, it's whether we're gonna do this very effectively or not. So I say to the state of Florida, the folks that are gonna take action here from here on out is that we're gonna use this as a stepping point to go ahead and make that first step, right? Because we have plenty of action to make and have plenty of discussions to have, but we're beyond that now. We've had our incidences. We already know we've started off 2019 very poorly in a lot of different realms, a lot of agencies experienced some of the worst catastrophes they've ever had in their entire agency history. Just in the last six months. So our time is over. Before stepping out of links, my last catastrophe was the Pulse. 50 people were killed that night. So we've had it. We've had our warning signs. We're ready to move on beyond the great matter. So I do have a few slides and I do have some special guests, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that it is your afternoon and you're here, and I'm hoping that we can get to a few items here. Working alone, why is that so significant in a bus operator's life, work life, working alone? Now you're like, no, 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 they're, they're working around all kinds of folks coming in and off that bus. Are they, as an employee, working alone? Yes. Do you work alone? No. They work alone, all by themselves. Even a beat cop when he goes out there, if it's in a dangerous neighborhood or a different type of night, do they work alone? No. <laughs> they work at night, they deal with Fairbox, they have a mobile workplace, it's on the move. Nothing like it in the world. Direct contact with the public, we're in a variety of community settings. You know where I'm going with this. So here's all the different items that we've heard about today. Police presence, partitions, training, cameras, prosecution, data interpretation, post assault programs. Now we've not, have we covered, have covered this yet? Have we covered this? We have. Now, let's talk about some of the information that should be shared as well. Transit assault is up 160%. Transit assaults result in injury up by 83%. Assaults result in fatalities, 22%. Vehicle versus transit facility. Why is that? <laughs> Riddle me this. Why? Work alone. So we talked about altercations, fare box related service issues. Give me an example of a service issue. <laughs> Late bus. Late bus. We've got it all figured out, right? 
We do, except for the construction, the road hazards, the potholes, the everything else that comes in, the next drop of the plate, and it goes on and on and on. So we know we're stepping into a hot box in the first place. However, transit planning is cute in a sense to where it's down to the minute. It's tough. It's not easy being someone who can rub on a crystal ball and have it right every single time and say, your traffic will be perfect today, and it's not going to happen. Okay, I did my job. I got someone to giggle. I don't know who it was, but thank you. All right, between 2013 and 15, 15 transit systems, 4,400 reported incidences. 340 of these were assaults on a transit operator, including spitting. The rest were disputes, threats, disorderly, objects, vandalism, and decent exposure in traffic. Interesting that traffic is on there, correct? And it should be. I'm going to use, out of respect for the most recent incident from Hart, and that's why we're here today. We are going to speak just really briefly about a few others that have been building up to the event, which in Albuquerque, bus rolls while a driver fights a passenger, attack in New Mexico, knocks out the bus driver, PSTA punched in the face over a fare, Hart, bus driver badly hurt after beaten by a passenger, Broward driver beaten by a passenger, and... Uh, so on and so forth. We sometimes need to have the boiling frog theory where the, the frog gets thrown in the pot and it bounces out because it's really hot and it, it'll boil in the pot because it slowly goes to the temperature. We in transit exactly haven't been the most pro, uh, prolific and be a, advanced thinking except for when we want to go get some new toys. And when we go out and get those new toys, we'll get ourselves all the best stuff and in uh, technology and sometimes in the vehicles and tangible objects, but what about, what are we doing for our employees? And our employees are important because they are the customer facing person. We should be customer centric. If we focus everything on our basics, and this is my new mantra for the next year or two, going back to the basics in transit, what do we do? What do we do best folks in transit? Yeah. We move what people. We Thank you. <laughs> you see what happens? Sometimes we get beat up in transit. Do we not? Do we not get beat up in transit? We're not as sexy as the fire department, and we're certainly not as sexy as the police department because they all have bright, shiny trucks and equipment and badges and stuff, and then there's transit. Transit's over here somewhere in this little moth posh. And you know what? We don't need that anymore. Actually, I, I, we need to see the, the leveling out of transit. Not only from the aspect of the ridership and being people proud of it, but also because you want to ride it. Because it's a wonderful resource, is it not? Economically, is it not a great resource? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. To your community, is it a great resource? To your population, is it a great resource? Absolutely, it is. Tough question. Let me tie up the tongue for a minute. Transient homeless population, 20 to 25 percent in the United States. Are you experiencing issues that are surrounding this area? Yes. Do you have a policy from A to Z that stipulates exactly how you're going to address it? No. no. Because we're in transit. And that means if it's not in our wheelhouse, what should we do next? Go outside of transit? Yes. Who can we reach out to to start discussing issues where we get educated and get a better understanding of how to approach this? Who do we ask? There you go. You've got to start somewhere. You cannot think that this is going away. Look what's going on with Narcan and all the other things. Were we doing that five years ago? Nope. Well, we weren't even really talking about it, were we? But we are now. Things change, and that's okay. So there's a lot of information on de-escalation. Ed already talked about it. A lot of the other folks talked about 
and, and, and there's great programs out there that you can research and draw from. Our, our program, especially from Cutter as well. Situational awareness is one that I'm gonna push even beyond de-escalation because in a society that we're working with right now, law enforcement, the military personnel, fire department, they know situational wellness quite well because they train in it. However, do we need to know more about situational awareness? Yes, we do. Remember when people say, watch your six? And you walk around and they say, follow what your gut's telling you? There's a lot of things that we need to learn about situational awareness. Because if I come in and I'm going to pay your fare, but I'm short and I have a vein sticking out, my vent, my, my clench is here, and I look like a robot, and I'm beat red, and I'm leaning in towards you, what is going on? Seriously, what is going on? Are you a possible target? Yes. So there's a lot of different things that we need to talk about. Today's not the forum, but we have programs for this. And I think I just blew up the computer. All right. So we already talked about the House bills and whatnot, but here is a national attention on penalties. 31 states who provide specific penalties in connection with harming transit school bus employees. Now, under here, assault mitigation infrastructure and technology, including barriers to prevent assault. We're talking about that. There's more information we shared. I just want to make sure we're not, we are engineering the problem out and not adding to an engineering nightmare. So there's a lot of information we need to share about those devices that are going in. De-escalation training. If you're a great operator, can I work in the system for 15 years before I go see you again? If I go in and I get hired in 2005 and I'm really good and I drive for 10 years, you're telling me how many contacts are you going to have with me if I'm not getting in trouble, have an accident or otherwise? <laughs> However, do we know that we're being aggressive enough with our contact with our employees on a regular basis through safety and security, regular meetings and whatnot, are we? I've spoken to a lot of folks that come from either maintenance or driver operator pool or even uh, in supervision that said, unless they get in trouble, when's the last contact they had with their so-called training division or other of those in supervision? The number goes down immensely. So we talked about modified bus specifications, driver assistance technology, and installation of driver seating uh, in regards to ergonomics. Someone was just actually showing me a fancy new seat that they're testing right now for this very cause. I'm not going to go much into the driver safety shields. I think Eric did a fantastic job going into the development and where it's being spent, who's doing it, and why they're doing it. But one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up, and I'm going to bring up the panel right now, and I'm going to reiterate this again. We are in the state of Florida. We've been enjoying a great transit environment for many years. It's been very quiet for many years. We've had wonderful consortiums and possibilities and meetings to go in and talk about all our concerns and air them out. And we do a very good job. In fact, when I travel throughout the United States, they bring up the state of Florida and the fact that we are in Florida and they poke a little bit of fun about the palm trees. But the one thing that they always bring up is that we are known to be good communicators. And I take that very pridefully. But at the same time, there's a gray area between what is happening in the rest of the world and then there's Florida to where now we're, we're being put into the same elements. Okay, it's happened at this point. So now it's time to take it to the next step. So what I'm going to do now is bring in those folks at the local and state level that are going to give us another viewpoint, not necessarily just from a national perspective, but for those of you that are Florida-based, here we go into where we get into the weeds a little bit. So I'd like to ask to come up Jafari, Gilbert, Richard, Jim, Ivan, Robert, Ashley, and uh, Colin, I think you are, uh, are you joining us? No, okay. We'll leave Colin out of here. Come on up. Oh boy, we're running out of space. Thank you. I am quite excited to 
be involved with getting into the weeds a little bit. So in this group here, and I'll ask all of you, thank you very much for coming up and being part of this this afternoon, and thank you for coming up and being part of something that's much greater than ourselves. So with that being said, I will move on to Mr. Jafari Bowden that I know from quite some time. We call him Little Jafari. He stands at like 6'10". I don't even go there. Uh, Jafari. safe operation with the bus. So this is more like it. We want our passenger to board the bus, nice smiling face, nice interaction with the operator. So what we have here is a mobile bus pass from Lynx. And on this mobile bus pass, you're able to purchase all fare media that Lynx offers that you can pay on the bus, simply board the bus, <clears throat> show the pass, operator pushes the button, count the passenger, and the customer can sit down and continue their commute. So other means of fare payment, fare kiosks. These are all payments where they take place off the bus and makes it easier transaction for the operator. So with fare kiosks, fare kiosks can be placed at your intermodals or bus stops where multiple buses service that location. Also, as you said, as you heard before, reloadable bus passes, similar to the Metro card in New York City, exercise down in Miami also, where a customer can reload their account, set up an account on their own, reload it as necessary, board the bus, swipe their pass, show their ticket, and board on, be able to continue their commute. Easy transaction for the operator. Also with that, fare reader cards with the TAP, which is used down in my own South Florida with the Tri-Rail system, makes it an easier transaction for the operator, customers will be able to board and it diffuse it, it, it introduces the ability to diffuse the interaction between the customer and the operator where the, where the operator feels like they have to be the enforcer for, for customers paying their fare. Now the biggest issue, one of our biggest issues is fare policy. So we all know that it's part of the operator's job to collect fares on the bus. But we also want to educate our customers to all of these different technologies as they are available at your agency to where paying on the bus actually becomes your last option. So the operators, like I said, they don't, feel, they don't have to feel like they're the enforcer of the fare. It makes it easier for the customer and the operator, smooth transaction, quicker transactions for, um, what's the word I'm looking for? On-time performance. So bus out, because even in my experience when I used to drive a bus in New Jersey Transit, we were able to load up 30 to 40 passengers within two or three minutes because they weren't paying fares coming out of New York City. So this is something that makes it a lot easier on the operator and the customer. So anybody want to continue the conversation, here's my contact, my phone number and email, and that's my time. Thank you. safety culture uh, today. However, I want to talk about the support system for the operators. Um, I want to talk about the support system also for the supervisors. When there's an event that happens, uh, our supervisors are the ones, and our communicators, road supervisors, they're the ones responding. Um, so what I want to do is make sure that they're getting adequate training. I want to make sure that they are being trained uh, adequately and on a regular that they have the tools that they need to respond correctly to each event. Um, also, just, just to make sure that they're qualified to even do the task or do the job. Uh, we, need to, we need to look into that. 
because it's a very stressful job to be in communications and respond to something uh, like an assault or uh, you have a lot of different events and things going on in that communications room. You have to make sure that um, you are equipped with everything that you need again and we make sure that we support our, uh, our supervisors. Um, also, we need to make sure that our policies and our procedures are followed correctly. Um, and that, we, that they're effective, that they're effective and that we, uh, that the processes make sense. Uh, we do, we sometimes we find our supervisors doing practical events, uh, where they're actually doing something opposite of what the policy and procedure says, but it actually is working. So, those are the key elements for time's sake that I wanted to cover, and I'm going to pass it over to the security, our security specialist, Mr. Gilbert Roberts. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm actually Gilbert Morales with Palm Fran, um, Director of Support Services, and I oversee uh, our support functions, which is IT, security, facilities, and customer service. Um, I believe looking around in this room, I'm the person with the least amount of transportation experience. Uh, luckily for me, what I do bring to Palm Fran is uh, leadership experience. I work for a security firm as well, and I was a city of Miami police officer for almost a decade. Um, I believe that I'll be able to bring fresh eyes into this. Um, and I was also a union member for 10 years, so I know the union is happy about that. <laughs> that forced me to have a French management. Um, in continuing our, our enterprise approach to safety and security, Comtran includes our employees from all levels. It's kind of something I haven't really heard much uh, being talked about here. Um, our executive leadership team, all the way down to our operators, uh, we're working on communicating with each level. Um, we also work with our partners in Palm Beach County, our risk management department land mass uh, county in Florida. So we have a lot of municipalities uh, within our land mass. Um, using this strategy, we manage risk and seize opportunities uh, related to the achievement of our objective, which ultimately is to maintain a system that is both safe and secure. I'm going to talk a little bit about barriers and technology. I know that we've talked about it quite a bit here today. Um, one thing we did different that I've heard some others talk about the barriers is we gave our operators a choice. Um, Sean Smith, uh, who's our director of operations, and Clint Ford, who's our executive director, who are in attendance, um, brought two companies down, installed barriers on two different buses. Uh, my marketing section, along with operations, put together a two-day survey at both of our locations to have our operators come in um, and pick which barrier they would like to have on the way through an emergency purchase to make sure that our fleet is out there as expeditiously as possible. Um, we currently deploy nine bus cameras on each of our buses, 11 on our articulating buses. Um, to enhance this technology, we want to rerun a script uh, on all of our buses, telling our passengers that they're being recorded, both video and audio. And then for the customer service element, we thank each passenger for riding during that script. To enhance this, right now we're also going to be purchasing the same monitors that will go on the bus. Um, I believe Eric was talking about those security awareness monitors. That once they step on the bus, they'll see themselves uh, in those monitors. And also, as they sit on the bus, they'll be rear facing so they know they're being uh, digitally recorded. Um, additionally, PalmTran, we have our covert emergency notification uh, systems as well. When the bus operator attacks their flip down, the LED monitors outside of the uh, buses will display emergency call release. <coughs> At the same time, it also opens up a mic for the communicators to listen to what's going on in the bus. Um, we're going to be asking for uh, um, more funding to have two PBSO deputies assigned to our bus system. It would be the same concept that Eric was also talking about, having uh, an officer ride uh, with a car in the back that would also be following the bus just in case an incident happens. Um, communication and reporting. To ensure our communication uh, system and reporting procedures work in tandem with our physical and technological security, and to ensure a proper police and fire response happens as soon as possible, mitigating the, possibility, the, the potential for escalation during an incident. Um, once an operator calls in an issue on a bus requiring an emergency response when they hit that sound alarm, uh, one of the communicators automatically dispatches police to the scene of that incident. The other communicator stays on the phone with the uh, operator trying to listen to more information so the police officers know exactly what they're walking into. So we want to talk about communication and inclusion at all levels. Once I heard about this process, I made sure to reach out to our union just to make sure that our operators are actually uh, understand what's happening here. And in speaking with White Magley, our ATU president who's here, 
I found out that the operators were under the impression that the communicator is asking questions and that's taking too long and is delaying the response for a police and fire. So now, knowing that the other communicator is already dispatching fire and police, together with the union, we can reach out to the operators and, and work on communication. And that's the inclusion from all levels. And this to me is a win-win. You get uh, more communication from management to the frontline employees, and it's safer for the uh, um, employees and also for the public that's riding our system. Unfortunately, we had an operator assault take place in one of our buses recently. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I wanted to talk about the procedure and highlight what worked and what didn't. So a bus operator was struck, it's a, a physical battery, it wasn't an assault, it was struck, and the police were contacted right away by the communicator. Um, unfortunately, he had fled before police got there. Uh, immediately, uh, our safety team and our security team went to work, pulling the bus video, and getting the picture of the offender out there. Well, within two days, a bus operator was looking at one of our bowling boards and noticed uh, the offender and knows an area where he frequents. Our, secure, our safety officer responds to the scene, located the offender, made contact with an off-duty police officer, and he was taken into custody right then and there. And he was also issued a trespass notice. So what worked? Teamwork, communication, something that we're trying to do better at Palm Tran as well. Um, getting that bolo out, you know, successfully two days later, we have him in custody. Collaboration and evaluation. As you, as you can see, Palm Tran doesn't rely on any one system for security and safety. We play an important role by taking accountability and collaborating to ensure our system is as safe as possible. All the way from the executive director down to our frontline employees, you know, we have safety meetings, we have ELT meetings, we have management leadership team. Every single employee that comes to Palm Tran has to make a meeting and sit down with our executive director. That's the kind of communication you want. The communication you want from your executive leadership team, your managers, your union. I've heard a lot of talk here, and uh, I think Eric said it best, that when it comes to safety, you do have to have that relationship, and we have it. ATU has my phone number. The bus operators will call me at two o'clock in the morning. I pick up my phone and I make sure that we address the issue. Um, lastly, I wanna thank everyone who came together for the Heart Symposium. I see a lot of leaders, safety and security professionals. I see different union representation here in the room. I wanna make sure that the conversation that we're having here doesn't stop today. It has to continue. So hopefully we can all get together again, have another symposium, share the information that we've shared already today, and come up together to uh, try to find ways to stop these oper operators from happening. Thank you. Thank you. But sometimes you have to look at your radio room, your dispatchers. When they interact with an operator that does have an issue out on the road, are they trying to second guess what's going on? Are they trying to, well, do you really have a problem? They have to really listen to the operator. Do they take it seriously? 
They don't want to second guess the operator and they don't want to try and, well, don't worry about it right now. But you also have to make sure that your operators are being truthful as to what's actually happening. They can't, you know, make it sound like something that it really is. Otherwise, you're just going to be chasing your tail. So if we're going to change the culture, we really need to look at what we're doing from the top. We need to let the people do what they're doing, and we need to let them make the decisions when they're out on the road. If they need police, if they need fire rescue, let them make the decision to the supervisors who may be in the radio room or in dispatch, right? So, one of the things that we always do out there is, oh, if there's an issue, call Bobby Bad Guy. We're dealing with Bobby Bad Guy. He's causing a problem. He's doing this. But is it, nowadays, it's a lot of the issues we're having, they seem to be mental. We need to take a different approach on how we're handling these things. Again, at MCAT in Manatee County, one of the things that we're starting to look at is, in, just in the last few weeks, we're starting to team up with our library, who is also having a lot of the same issues that we're having on the buses with some of our passengers, and they're stemming from mental illness issues, not just overall bad guy issues. And look at some of the people that are on your buses. A lot of it stems from homelessness, just people that aren't on your meds, or maybe they should be on your meds. So that's what's causing the problems. So what we're doing in, in Manatee, we're a county operation. We're not an authority. And the county libraries are having the same problems. A lot of the homeless people are hanging around all day long. They're causing issues. So we're teaming up with them. We have one of our uh, terminals that isn't as popular or used as some of the other ones. And hopefully what we're going to be able to do is bring in some of the social services, some of the uh, homeless coalitions, and maybe some of the uh, mental health organizations. And maybe they can, throughout the other terminals, set up shop maybe once, twice a week, or maybe a couple times a month, and direct some of these people that may need their services or aren't necessarily utilizing these services and bring them in to get the help that they need. And who knows, that might be able to help some of the situations that they may be having on the buses or at the stations or at our terminals and maybe cut down on some of the situations we're having there. Could it work? Who knows? But you know what? Here's the box. Here's MCAT. Might be something that'll help out along the way. So, because not everything is an arresting offense. Some of the law enforcement people that I've spoken to over the time, you know, what do they get to use? Well, they get to vaporize people. But what does that do? That just gets them out of their hair for 72 hours. And then guess what? <laughs> they're right back in. <laughs> they're, 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 three days from now, it's their problem all over again. So maybe this is a way that we could, you know, mitigate some of the issues that we're having. I'm not going to get rid of them, but maybe it might help them and help us in the long run. So it's a new approach. We're going to offer the, you know, to these organizations, to these social service groups. You know, again, MPAN has a everybody rides policy. So if you're short 25 cents or 50 cents, I don't care. I tell all my new operators, you're not a fair enforcer, you're a fair collector. If the guy's short 50 cents, they're not locking the doors tonight. Fair police aren't going to come shut you down and lock you up and fire you. You know, we're not going bankrupt. Let them ride. If tomorrow the same guy comes up and he's short 50 cents, remind him. If it's a problem, you know where he got on, you know where he's going to get off. When he gets off, he's going to walk into the arms of the supervisor. You call the supervisor, let it be his problem. And then we shut off his American Express right there. Because the next time he's done, going to ride. They'll be reminded. Take care of the problems a different way. It's not your bus. Don't be the captain of the ship. Again, that compounded with the change of morale. Work from the bottom up. 
Let, don't let scheduling be an issue to kill your morale. Don't let the operator be upset because he knows his day is going to be ruined because of scheduling. Let the operators have a handle on what your scheduling is going to be. Let the operators have a handle on all of the things that the management feels that they need to control. Take their word for it. We're sitting in the office all day long. They're the ones that are driving the bus all day long. So who do you think knows how to do the job better? I did it a long time ago. I could tell you how it was when I drove a bus in and out of New York every day. I couldn't tell you how it is today to drive a bus in and out of New York every day. I know my boss used to tell me how it was for him in 1965. And I used to laugh at him because I reminded him that every single town is aided by 10 traffic lights. So I'm not that naive to think that it's going to be the same now. So who do I want to listen to? Me? No, but I know who to listen to to tell me how to get my operation running efficiently. And again, you know what it's done? My morale has gone from the toilet to the attic. And you can do the same. Don't tell me you can't. Because as I learned, I used to one rule was the only thing you can't do is you can mitigate a lot of your operator passenger incidents a large degree. Because that's where it starts. And I know because I spent 15 years in safety and security, and everybody here knows that when you watch a lot of these videos, and I don't care if you're management or union, when you watch a lot of these videos, where does the thing escalate at? It doesn't escalate in the back of the bus, it escalates in the front of the bus. And anybody in here that's management, and you work your way up, or if you're union, and you're still driving a bus, it starts here. So if you're in a good mood, and as she says, Every day she just wanted to make somebody happy. When was the last time you got in an argument with somebody? So again, if we can build up our morale, we can mitigate a lot of our problems. So with that, want to talk to me? That's how you can get a hold of me. And as you can tell, I'm not very opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ivan Moat. I, I, I didn't submit that picture. That's an old picture. <laughs> but I'm, I'm one of those guys when they mention uh, never worked in, never drove a bus, don't know anything about safety and security. I'm that guy. Um, I was chief on the fire department. I'm retired. And what I want to tell you in transit that we are connected. When uh, the bus service stopped at 2 o'clock in the morning, we get that call, that's one of the transit passengers who can't get to the hospital. So our level of frustration goes up because we walk in the house and say, why did you dial 911? I don't have a ride to the hospital. <laughs> Look at your clock, bus service is stopped, we're stuck with it. Uh, the other thing I bring, uh, we're going with SMS now. Um, in the medical field, in the military, we did something called uh, root cause analysis that sounds similar to SMS because uh, working in avionics with airplanes, the fire department, we couldn't afford to make a mistake. Our mistakes were deadly. So we did what was called, what caused it, because the next time it happened, it could take someone's life. Uh, just about everything that's been said, they pretty much did my presentation, so we're just gonna talk for about 10 minutes. <laughs> But what, what SMS is, we want to do proactive measures. Uh, like you said, when I came to transit, what I found that transit was uh, sort of behind the curve. We could query accidents with the uh, push of a button. We had to digitize everything. We had to change the cultures. Uh, you could walk in and out of the campus. Uh, so we locked the campus down and we had a crawl, walk, run phase. We put security, security on the gate, said you can't come on to JTA property unless you have a badge. 
We had fights, confrontations, so I didn't put guns on our security guard because we didn't want an accidental shoot of uh, one of our employees. <laughs> so once we uh, got to a, a phase where the culture changed, you, you heard that a lot, is that we had to have a culture change. Once we got to a point where the culture changed, put a weapon on the supervisor, then we're going to put weapons at the gates because now we're not afraid of that confrontation when people saying, I worked here for 20 years, I should be able to come on and off of the campus anytime I get ready. Only thing is, we're worried about terrorism, but domestic violence is our biggest threat. If you're in a relationship and you sneak out of the house, guy, girl, you move, your partner might not know where you move to, but they know where you work. So if I want you, I'll wait at your job and walk onto that campus without a badge and I can harm you in the parking lot of, of your job. So we had to shut that down. Uh, customer service training. Barriers themselves should not give you a sense of security. You're just a mean operator behind a barrier. It takes a little more effort to get to you. So customer service is, that's the proactive measure. And what I compare it to, we have Publix here. How many people been to Publix? Uh, Chick-fil-A. You don't go there looking for a confrontation, do you? You go there expecting good service. You're like, they're like, hey, you know, my order's messed up. They're shoving you another. You can keep that one. Yeah. An argument in these stores lasts about two seconds. But when you go into Walmart, the fist ball, you sleep with your fist ball, thinking that you got to go to Walmart. Ah, two registers open, I got all this stuff. You're looking for the confrontation. You're ready to fight. And that's what it's like when you know that that bus is coming around with a rude operator. That passenger's sitting there and they can see you through the windshield. Oh, I got this rascal again. They're looking for the confrontation. Because we work, because the operators work alone, that puts you in danger. Because they're expecting the confrontation. You having a bad day, that's a recipe for disaster. So we have to have the barrier with customer service training on the front end. Uh, we want to teach it during onboard and coordinate safety meetings. We want to reteach, retrain when we have those problem employees, and there's probably 12. Now, each one of the agencies probably have the same 12 employees that you know their name. I guess you again. <laughs> so we do root cause analysis. And what we want to do is find out as SMS what actually took place. Did this customer trespass? They have a mental issue. So when we see them in the trespass hearing, I want to see that they're medicated now because that's what we deal with. If they come in and they're still acting out of sort, we renew the trespass. We won't uh, lift the trespass. EAP referrals. If you're just disciplining uh, employees without getting to the root cause again, talking to them, they could be going through public service is tough. It's tough. In transit, it's tough with police officers, it's tough with firefighters. One of the things we did was uh, an EMS, they have what's called the hero mentality. And we would see it, and they would walk in the door and say, why'd you call us for this? We're macho firefighters, we don't deal with this little stuff. So what they did is they forgot that the reason they had a job was because of that bogus call. That if people stopped out dial 911, there wouldn't be a need for firefighters, police officers. And if they stopped riding the bus, they wouldn't have a need for anybody in this room. So what we had to do is refocus their efforts to tell them that we're about our customers. I know, you know, we, we have our pensions and things of that nature. However, we have to remember that that mentally ill customer, well, that homeless guy, once they buy a bus patch, they're a customer. And they deserve the same treatment as everyone else. And you have to have punitive measures. It can't just be, oh, you didn't give good customer service. Don't worry about it. Because good customer service uh, is lacking in probably 90% of the assault. It started out with somebody just not answering how much is the pass, how much is the ride bus, where does this bus stop? What's the next bus stop? They got, a, they got an answer that wasn't professional and it elevated. De-escalation is a reactive measure. It's already out of control. Teaching de-escalation is proactive, but implementing de-escalation is reactive. It's already out of control. 
and say we have the operator barriers, installing the operator's barriers is a proactive measure. The use of it is reactive. We have a, a problem on the other side of that barrier. We began uh, baby testing in 2017. Uh, we did the same thing, uh, let the operators experience a couple of different barriers and decide on which one they wanted. We heard the same things. Uh, some of the operators felt closed in, disconnected from the public. Majority of operators uh, wanted the barriers and the decision we made in 2018 to purchase and it's now standard equipment on all of our newer buses. So that's where we are today. Um, I went fast and that's because we pretty much covered it. It's the same thing, same problems you're having at your agency, we're having at ours. And I think if we get together and uh, uh, figure it out together, the same solution you have will work for us. So that's what we're here for, is to get together, put our heads together because we have some smart people in this room. And I think we can figure out a way that'll make these operators safe, the employees safe, that you can go to work and return home in the same way you came. Thank you. Some other folks, um, Eric, 
uh, Palm Tran. Uh, they've got excellent security and emergency preparedness plans. Um, Dean McMillan leads up our uh, compliance group. She goes to agencies all over the state and does triennial reviews. She looks at um, security and emergency preparedness plans with her teams. She has a great idea. She is a great resource. If you want to know who has a good policy on X, talk to Dean. She'll be able to point you in the right direction. So um, that's that's where we can continue this conversation. Um, FDOT is a resource for you. Um, any any information you want to know, any any studies you want to undertake, um, please get in touch with me. Um, this next slide has my information. And FTSON.org. Um, has a whole section on operator assaults. Um, we'll, we'll supplement it with Eric's information, um, link hopefully to the information Mr. Watt handed out and, and has up on his website. So, um, thank you.
Um, and, and forgive me for reading slide. My boss is going to kill me later uh, because I come from a government and military background, and uh, many of you remember that. That's a scripted slide. So uh, he, he's always he's always getting on me for that, and I do apologize, boss. But without slides, um, that's basically where I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> well, it, traditionally, many uh, systems are piecemeal. They're they're kind of put together over time, um, as budgets allow. Um, you know, it's um, uh, you have an episode or an incident that happens, and then you can put it in capex, and then eventually you call an integrator, and they help you design something. But it's rarely you see. Uh, someone to be able to put down everything and start new with a new design. So with that, you get a lot of, uh, kind of negatives and drawbacks. You get poor, poor performance uh, with the system. You um, Usually you don't have great coverage, and I think Eric, you, you showed a great slide. Where are you at, Eric? These are somewhere. Um, oh, there you go. On, um, uh, on coverage in a vehicle, and I, I would love to steal that slide for your overlapping coverage inside your buses. For the video, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, but that's a traditional problem that people don't really do the math, so to speak. So you'll have blind spots, you'll have things like that that, that really get in, uh, in the way and cause problems. And you find that with these piecemeal put together over time old systems. Um, inactive monitoring, and that's something that is totally normal because you're rarely going to find anyone that's going to sit there and, and stare at a monitor or a bank of monitors. And they're going to find something that's going to happen and prevent it from happening. That that's that doesn't work that way. Um, here for you know, CCTV systems have just been the nucleus of a good forensic tool, and um, many of you understand how pulling footage. Um, it's like show me what happened. Security is supposed to be finding out what's going to happen and stopping it from happening. And um, so we need to get out of that mentality of uh, being a forensic tool. And I definitely need a glass of water because my, uh, my wonderful RA that I have is uh, about killing me right now. Thank you, sir. Well, for, um, uh, for the advanced technologies that I said before are considered off the shelf and available, um, they. Um, there are some things that are actually like AI or artificial intelligence that's built into some of these things. Doesn't mean it, uh, it it's going to be doing all of those overwhelming things. And don't be afraid of when you see the AI component. It's basically saying that it's more intelligent, more robust capabilities. Um, situational awareness, and I and I believe that was brought up uh, in an earlier presentation as an important thing. And, it, and it's and it's everything. You have to know what's going on. Um, you want to have a system that can. Show you through a video verification what's happening at all times. Um, you have uh, your operators, let's say, hit the, the panic alarm. You want to have it connected, and these these technologies will allow you to do that. They'll allow you to connect directly, um, and so as soon as somebody hits the button, wherever it's at, um, uh, in the driver's compartment or operator's compartment, it automatically links to your um, not just your road supervisors. Your control center, your if you have a transit police organization or local and local law enforcement and security, whoever you know is capable of getting that and being part of the response uh, planning, uh, they need to see that. When it comes through, it should alarm. Their monitor will come up and it'll it'll be loud, audible alarm. It'll show red. It'll get your attention. It could be your monitor, your laptop your iPad, your handheld, wherever you're at in the world. It's just like they're, they're selling Simply Safe Security, um, which looks very simple, but it's a, it's a very interesting concept. And using um, you know, the internet, so to speak, you can really reach out at all times, you know, globally and plot all these things. Um, one of the things that, um, that gives you is system confidence. Um, you know, everybody needs to be confident in, the, in all of the phases of protection, uh, of course. Uh, but um, when when somebody mentioned, I'm thinking that actually this is about to cross off for being alone, and that really resonated with me. I, I never thought about it like that. They are uh, alone out there, and they need to be confident in all of the things, not just the the capabilities of the response force and the timeliness until arrived, but they really need to know that. 
hey, those little dome cameras up there really are watching everybody here, and they are providing a valuable service. They may save me from harm, they may save my life if the system is functioning to its um, you know, greatest extent. Most, um, I, don't, I know it's not a terribly scientific study, but um, by and large, I think that most organizations, regardless of the critical sector they're in, not just service transportation, they're missing about 60% of the true latent capability of their existing CCTV system. They're, they're just not um, used to their full extent. And um, one thing we, uh, we can definitely uh, encourage people to do is um, use Wi-Fi transmitters on their buses. You can send um, streaming live video, lots of frames per second, um, to whatever addresses you want them to, um, to you know, be received at. You can connect them to network uh, video recorders. You can literally store things in petabytes, not just terabytes. So it's, you don't have to set these limits of 10 days, 30 days, 90 days necessarily. So you can have readily available um, video for, for detectives, um, you know, your law enforcement investigations, you know, internal reviews, um, training, you know, I mean, we do great training with some of the video. When you can retrieve it quickly and efficiently and cost effectively because it's already there on your system, you don't have to manually go and take out the, you know, the DVR and take it to someone and have them, you know, I think it was between this hour and that hour and look for this. Uh, some of this intelligent video, you can, you can just put in a, um, you know, a descriptive, uh, you know, kind of search term. Mm -hmm. It'll go right to that. Um, guy in a red shirt, you know, there it is. Uh, it's very, very interesting what you can do. Uh, video management systems, VMS, there's also the PCM, the physical screen, um, um, information management systems that are out there. There's software that goes sometimes in the camera itself, sometimes back in the, the head end. Um, it can really increase um, your effectiveness because it can control uh, various components that are connected to your security system, to include your fire alarms and your, your burglar alarms, anything you can think of being connected to this. Video analytics, um, one thing that I wanted to make sure you guys understood was available was and I think many of you, uh, obviously, the security experts know this, facial recognition, object recognition, I, I really believe that it's applicable um, for bus safety and security. <laughs> it programs to see a done, to see a nine, and it will instantly alert. And if your system is event-driven, meaning all of it's tied together, and it will automatically audibly alert your response force, um, that's, that's the definition of an event-driven system. So you want that when somebody pulls something out and is holding it there. And if you have your cameras with all the overlapping coverage and there's no blind spots, it's going to catch it and it will automatically alert and it will, you know, whatever your policy is or your procedures for responding, then that's what you do. Um, the um, other things that it can do is you have all your suspension lifts and your truck passers, all other bullets, people that do things on transit, properties anywhere um, on buses, the ones that, you know, try to do the, the grab, the touch, the smack, the, the pour, and all you have is an image of their face, that's great because you can program all of those people in to watch for them the next time they enter the bus. Then with that video evidence, they can be charged. And then you can issue, you know, some hopefully ironclad suspensions. And also um, operators who, you know, when you're looking at a you know, two-dimensional image of someone, it's really difficult, uh, and I interviewed a whole lot of bus operators recently. It's very, very difficult for them to realize, um, is that really the person that's on the trust pass list? You know, they don't wear signs that say, hey, you, you kicked me off last month, or I'm not supposed to be riding this bus. This software will automatically, the second they step foot, you have that camera facing right in that entrance, and voila, I mean, it's going to tell the operator, plus it's also going to tell the control center, road supervisor, security, and um, law enforcement. Whoever you want it to alert to and inform, it will do that. That's a very important thing. And um, uh, once again, uh, event-driven uh, system I mentioned earlier, um, it should be the goal for everyone, regardless of the industry that they're in. Um, the uh, technology is there. Um, in many areas, it's very cost-effective. 
uh, especially in ROI and all of those other things of aftermath of what happens post incident with people count for extended periods of time and lost production and you know all all the costs that come along with you know, having to pay for an incident that happens. Uh, perhaps um, it's better to invest up front and avoid some of these um, incidents from happening in the first place. So once again, I'm Rob Clark, and I appreciate very much you uh, inviting me here and the release group. Thank you. So a couple more uh, pieces for thought on your way out the door this afternoon. I promised Colin that even though I was given the green light to go over, I am definitely not going over with this group. We are going to be done and we will be out of here at three o'clock, which is just, just a few more minutes. Two uh, thought provoking items. Number one, how many of you have been in your current role with your current title uh, and or have moved or gotten another job in the last five years? How many of you have a new role, new title, and new, not profession, but you're in a new title, new role right now in the last five years? And the vast majority, if I were to take a straw poll, we probably have about 75% in this room who have promoted, moved on, moved out, moved into a new role in the last five years. Why does that have anything to do with what we're talking about today? Think about it for a second. Why does that have anything to do with what we're discussing? The experience, correct? The experience at the end of the day, what we're moving from is in a workforce of 20 year plus to a workforce of five years or less. Okay, so when you think about there, there's a good thing and a bad thing that can come out of this. The good thing is, if you've ever wanted to change in your division, department, or agency, now's the time to do it. Take advantage of the culture that you are just now getting because if we were to ask this question during the economic downfall, what was the other end of it? No one was going anywhere. Why? Because that's the climate that we are in. Our climate right now has been moving on a sped, uh, at a steadfast pace that is increasing faster than we even know what to do about. It. So what that means is that people are moving into new roles faster than we've ever seen before. Take advantage of the change. The downside is again, then you're losing some of that workforce knowledge. And when you lose that workforce knowledge, you lose a little bit of momentum. But you gotta turn the negative into a positive. Number two, who runs transit 24-7? Uh, administration's not there at midnight. The employees do. The mechanics, the operators, and the supervisors run transit 24-7. The vast majority of us here do not. So I would think that the relationship that everybody has brought to the forefront, which is culture relationship, uh, understanding your employees, work with your employees, and I love the engineering, education, and enforcement, but I like practice. And the reason why I like practice is because it takes the culpability down a notch and says it's okay to make a mistake without getting crucified. Do we practice enough? No. But what do all the other elements out there that do? Remember I said about police, fire, whatnot, what do they do 24 seven, all the time? Practice, practice, train, train, practice, practice, train, train. Why? Because Mr. Mo said it, we don't have the room to mess up. Well, why don't we adopt a little bit of that philosophy? And instead of making pull out absolutely the number one priority, which it is, don't get me wrong, I understand we have a business to run. However, we haven't done such a great job in the arena of training, education, and practice. Because just like emergency management, when there's no emergencies going on, where's emergency management? Kind of here. And as we get closer to the season, it gets here and here, and then when it hits the fan, it's here. And then what happens again? Training and education falls in the same category. So unfortunately, what we need to do is wrap our, rounds around, wrap our hands around and send ourselves back to algebra, because everybody loves that class. And if you haven't been in the gym in a while, remember that first week in the gym, how'd you feel? Sore. So are you gonna feel a little sore after this? You should, it's okay. That means you're doing something, right? So the takeaway from this, and I know I have a, a, a big speaker to come up here in a second, is to take action and not inaction. Don't be someone who just resolves to show up when it happens, but be the one that's in the front side that says, we've already been talking about this. 
I encourage you that from the presenters from this morning and the presenters this afternoon, you mainly have a lot of uh, people that are movers and shakers. So I resolved the fact that most of the people in this room are movers and shakers. So every time we see each other, we're gonna ask, what are you doing now? Not what did you do before? With that, I'd like to introduce the man behind this whole day today, Mr. Carl Malloy. Thank you for being here. And um, before we kind of wrap up, one of the things I wanted to make sure is that um, we gave uh, Mr. Lowry, if you could uh, come up and a couple words. Thank you. Everybody, let's please for comment. As, as you heard before, I've been on the bus line for 25 years. And on behalf of the ATU, uh, we're here because we want to be a part of the success of this. We don't want to be an opponent to this, we want to be part of the success. And so, what we're asking you to do is understand that we can put all differences aside when it comes to safety and this issue, and we need to work together. You heard the TWU working very well with Miami. The AT wants the same thing. We're hoping that we walk away with this and go back to our communities and have some kind of arm in arm moment together, whether it's saying to our elected officials that House, you know, the House bill 1139 is something that we all are on board with, or we're moving in the same direction to try to encourage, and then get together, get into committees, work together. And I love the part where I've heard over and over and over, keep the bus operators, keep the union involved, because we need to be a part of this with you, because we're the, we're the voice for the workers. And so the workers, you know, when you approach them, they're gonna turn, and they're gonna walk right over to their union representative and they're gonna say, what's this all about? They, they need to trust that we're all working on the same page. So thank you, Colin, for giving me the moment. And, and speaking of leadership, we have a member of our board of directors here that I wanted to recognize and also ask her to come up, uh, Dr. Kimberly Bowman. I'm Kimberly Overman. I am actually on the Board of County Commissioners for Hillsborough County as well as on the Board for Heart and a whole bunch of ad hoc committees. <laughs> Every time I, I go to a board meeting, Heart puts me on another committee. But uh, I went to the, to the APTA conference last week and, and met with um, leaders all over the country and safety was part of the agenda there. Um, I am so proud of hearing what's being spoken of today. I got elected in November. I met Thomas Dunn in December at my very first heart meeting, and I cried over Thomas Dunn in May. So I am proud of this organization that is working so hard to bring safety and security here from the very top to the very bottom of the organization and all the way across the board. Safety has been not only in my life something that's critically important, but what I'm glad to see is that the leadership is talking about it doing something about it, and working with all the team members to make it happen. And that's what it takes, as you just mentioned. It takes all sides, because what's most important and what I recognized when I realized what was going on in May is that other than our first responders, as you mentioned earlier, our operators are on that front line. You are our front line. And when we know that, we recognize how valuable it is that you put the face on and that you're there every day defending not only yourselves, but also our community and other organizations. Thank you so much for coming out today and look forward to more conversation. Thank you so much. And um, I really want to thank our board of directors. Um, I want to thank our employees, um, especially our bus operators. Um, if you guys could stand up, members of uh, PART, our employees. This symposium, you know, when we had the tragic event that occurred in May, we knew that we needed to do some things and bring this issue to the forefront. 
And one of the biggest takeaways that I've gotten, I think, is that labor management communication. And I can stand here today to tell you that that is gonna be a number one priority. Safety and security is paramount to heart. And we will continue this conversation. We will work together as a unit, as labor and management, to come up with solutions. You have my word, and I know our CEO is fully behind this effort as well. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone in this room, uh, your support um, and your guidance, and to all our panelists, thank you very much.